Bloggers and Bandicoots, both heads of bludgers. It's party time! It's time to dance. It's time to prance. Yes! It's time to blow into the bug house. Tonight, Ryan HD's bug house, where the beers are cold and the spirits are hot. Featuring answer, the Nissan Zedricks. Yeah! So open your curtains and welcome the scene. Turn out the lights and think of their old flame. And they bring out the seaweed. Britain's brand new Bee Gees. Yeah! Yeah! <laughs> and now, give a big bug house for us to our host for this evening. The Cunning Cats of Kesa. Those Cruising Cobras of Chroma. Those Norman Knights from Norfolk. And now Anglia's own Rampage and Roy Slaven. And H.G. Nelson. Yes. Uh, thanks very much indeed, Melvin Hayes. Thanks very much, Nissan Cedrics. Thanks very much, Britain's brand new Bee Gees. Yes, hello everyone, Cooey customers. And welcome to Roy and HG's Bug House on a night when too much variety will be barely enough. And uh, tonight, the Bug House comes to you live from the Prince Charles Goes Native Room here in the Keep of the Norwich Castle. And to torch the week on another week of action, danger, romance, adventure and intrigue in the bug house, let's simply ask Rampaging Roy Slavin, which issue have you plucked from the tissues this week, pal? Thank you uh, very, very much, H.G. Nelson. Uh, look, I think the issue that's gripped the nation is the uh, Blair government here in the United Kingdom powdering yes. and allowing cigarette sponsorship with Formula One motor yes. racing. Yes. Look, I don't have any real problems with this. As long as they make everyone associated with Formula One smoke. Yes. yes. That's what I want to see. Mm. I want to see Jacques Villeneuve mm. going around the chicanes with a little cheroot on yeah. his like, Flicking one out as he goes by. Yeah, that's right. Lighting was... another one up. Yes, lighting one up. Yeah. I want to see Johnny Herbert with a pipe. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's what yeah. I want to see. I want to see yeah. pit crews with one hanging out as they put the put petrol, petrol in. <laughs> Wigging down the lens. That's what I want to see. Right, yes. I want to see the average age of uh, Formula One. Anyone associated with Formula One being about 45 years old. Cancer and cars. It's a natural. <laughs> yes. Well done, Blair. Yes. <laughs> and with that as a way of setting the scene. <clears throat> mm. 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 Oh, he's a gutless clown. Yes. yes. Not prepared to say that to his face. Yeah. Blair, you're a gutless clown. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Roy, with that as a way of setting the scene, and I think you did it very, very well, uh, <laughs> it's now time to welcome a man who loves to bend over the green and yeah. fondle a very long pointy pole as he pushes <laughs> balls towards top pockets and so on. <laughs> Nissan Cedrics, can you win the trophy when you sink the pink? And when you drop the black, can you give us the Steve Davis story? <laughs>
You've done well, Steve. Don't, don't worry about it for the minute. You know, sure, you're a little underdressed. I'm just but, uh, a bit underdressed, aren't I? I think I'm... you've done pretty well. Uh, pretty well. Now, let's set the scene here for a bit of a conversation, a bit of a powwow, by having a look at you in 1992 here, getting a bit of a break in the action. Uh, let's have a look at uh, on screen now. Obviously a tricky one here. You sink the black and move the ball back onto the reds nicely, and then go for the red in the side pocket, which works out pretty well. Then it gets a bit more tense here with the black into the other pocket, the bottom pocket. <laughs> then you go across there. Gee, by gee, you're racking him well here. Then it's back into the black. This is what people are familiar with. And then here you go with another uh, red into the side pocket, very carefully there. And then as they tense up, you bugger it up there. <laughs> address this problem of sponsorship in sport which the government's allowed smoking in F1 and I understand the snooker community as a group is up in arms <laughs> thinking if it's good enough for bloody F1 it could be good enough for snooker to get cigarettes exactly in. and uh, and I think uh, I think we will be back seeing uh, smokers on, in snooker but um, apparently... could you see uh, all all uh, players must smoke while playing the game of snooker as rule one in the snooker rule book <laughs> well possibly uh, and I think over the table is a problem because in, in oh. most snooker clubs you're not really allowed to smoke well, I think over that's the where, table. That's what's holding the game back. I can see nothing wrong with, <laughs> say, yourself with a nice king size ablaze, leaning right over, dropping a bit of ash there, getting a bit of a hole going there, <laughs> and potting obviously the black, and then sinking a nice bit of phlegm into the side. <laughs> <laughs> there would be nothing wrong with that. I think that would get people back to the game of snooker. Yes, and we miss pot plants as well. We haven't got as many pot plants as we used to. That would be a place to, like, dunk them out in. But uh, I miss pot plants a lot. We don't... We well, who doesn't? Pot plants have kept this world going for many, many years on yeah. many continents. <laughs> and I don't want to get started on that, Roy. Yes, Steve, I spent a lot of time with uh, Eddie Charlton uh, years ago, uh, great Australian uh, player. Uh, he told me, as you get older, that uh, the muscle memory tends to evaporate a little bit. And I notice you've had a little bit of this trouble yourself. Not that you're getting old, but just as the years stretch out a little bit. And what I mean by muscle memory, when you're uh, over, let's say this is the cue table, right. or the, uh, the, the pool table, you're over here like this. It's this action here that, uh, that that's where the, the muscle memory <laughs> tends to go, because you can start to get lateral movement. And when you get the lateral movement, you're absolutely buggered, Steve. And this is what happens. Now, what happens is a player gets older, he grips the cue harder and harder to stop this lateral movement. Now, what Eddie said to me was, learn to go loose. <laughs> learn to go loose. Are you loose on the right hand these days, Steve? <laughs> it's difficult to say. I spend a lot of time away from home in tournaments. Uh, yes. so, uh, <laughs> Can I ask you about the characters in the game these days? It seems snooker seems to be not as prominent as it was, uh, you know, no. when Whispering Ted Lowe was uh, voicing a lot of commentary. And I put it to you that there are no great characters. When you look back, I mean, when I was a kitty, there was Eddie Charlton, of course. Yes. Big Bill Wubernick. Big now, there's a name that brings back many, many memories to people all around the world. Big uh, blubbery Bill Wubernick. Yes. Indeed, indeed. Big beer-drinking Bill Wubernick. Twelve points before Fatty. he could bend over. We, uh, well, he was big. Yes. Mm. He was no, a big, big man. Big. Time. And did he have a doctor's prescription that told him you know, that he had to drink beer during every tour. Was, <laughs> was that the case? He did actually have a, a medical condition, which was... Um, so he reckons. Well, so he says. <laughs> um, and apparently, the only reason he stopped was that he, he couldn't take beta blockers and beer at the same time. Um, right. But it was something to do with the shakes. Mm. Well, he had the shakes if he wasn't... You know. If he didn't drink a steady intake of beer, and he was up to about 24 pints of lager mm. uh, during a best of 17 match, and then perhaps a couple to relax afterwards. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but the problem became that, that uh, as he got more and more into it, uh, yeah. he was going to the toilet more often during a frame. Uh, yes. yes. And yes. that became an annoying thing yes. for, the, for his opponent. How do the rules stand there? Because uh, in Australia... You put your you... hand up, I think. Ah. Is, is, uh... well, we just had to do it in our trousers at home. Well, we, uh... <laughs> And it was an attractive on. feature That's that a lot of people enjoyed, uh, <laughs> seeing a bit of sock drip. But, uh... <laughs> Can I ask why he wasn't called an alcoholic, Big Bill Wubernick? <laughs> I mean, well, we had a couple of the... other players for that particular, yeah. <laughs> right. Bill right. had the, sort of the large niche, yeah. and, and we had other players who were, were in the alcoholic part. And, Do you and... get drugs in snooker? I mean, oh. are many on sort of ecstasy or um, <laughs> we had a, acid we... or something like <laughs> that? <or> we... <laughs> We did have a beta blocker scare, but it wasn't yeah. really... Uh, nobody was really do, um, taking beta blockers other than the fact that um, 
they had a heart complaint. So it was a bit, it was yeah. blown out of all proportion, uh, I think. Unlike the Hurricane Higgins incidents, which were kept nicely under the carpet, I felt, at the time. Well, <laughs> possibly. Yes. But <laughs> notice how our conversation already, we've only been going a few minutes, and yet we've covered a whole gamut of drugs. Uh, I mean, it's hard, to, it's hard not to mount a thesis that snooker is riddled with drug-taking, <laughs> drug interests. Well, possibly, and of course we have, uh, we have cigarette sponsors as well, but oh, um, yes. you know, it would be nice to, to think that we would go down the same line as motor racing in the end. Look, how, uh, how corrupt is snooker? <laughs> uh, uh, it's as corrupt as buggery, isn't it? Let's, let's face it. <coughs> well, I was involved in, in possibly the, the closest finish in the World Championships, uh, which was, I think, 18, 17 against Dennis Taylor, which finished as corruptly as you could possibly do on the black, yeah. which was the complete fix, obviously. Although, strangely, <laughs> strangely, um, I also played John Parrott and beat him 18-3 and lost a session on television, so I'm not too sure where the script went wrong there. Yes. But, um, there have been two moments where betting has been suspended in 20 years of snooker, so I think it stands up pretty well. But you could read it another way, possibly, but there may be your upbringing, I don't know. Yes. Uh, oh. Oh. <laughs> so are you telling me it's as clean <laughs> as a whistle? It's, Have it you ever been offered is. money to, you know, back in all. the 80s? Were you ever offered no. a bit of money to roll over? Never, no. no. And in Norwich tonight, uh, you know, would, how, much, how much would points be offered hustle-wise? Uh, you know, is there a standard rate? You know, <laughs> if we went out tonight with the cues, got them out of the boot of the car and looked for a bit of action, how, how much trouble could we get into, say, if we had a losing... This is obviously... People might recognise you a little bit, but they may not recognise me. Uh, you know, if we got into a bit of a game, you know, what, what, what sort of money could we expect to turn over? You'd be very lucky to be able to, as an unknown, to be able to make any money. People would smell a rat and they'd go away. Even if I had a moustache and I think you'd struggle. Yeah. You would struggle. Right. Um, yeah. and, and I thought on various occasions it would be fun to turn up in, a, in a disguise and win somebody's money at a local snooker club and then give it all back at the end and say, yeah. mm. only joking. Yeah, I'm yeah. sorry, Davis. Um, <coughs> <coughs> but, um... I tell, honestly, it's very, I mean, I know, I know we're only talking with three of us about, yeah. about it, but um, uh, it's, it's, it's as clean as there is. I mean, motor racing. Yes. Which, well, that's uh, corrupt. corrupt. I mean, that's, no, that's corrupt. Yeah. I mean, they, they get orders there to yes. take out somebody. Mm, well, that's I mean, right. We don't do that. Mm. After the game, you can take people yeah. out for a meal or two. Are there any, though, cheats? Cheats. You know, because I remember playing Eddie years ago, and he'd cough. Cheats. Yeah, cheats. He'd cough every time I was about to... Oh, well, that, well, I can't speak for Eddie, because I don't know what his personal habits are. And chalking the cue on the backswing. Yeah. Another one, uh, yes. yes. Yeah, but did these you ever do not, that? These are a bit hard to do uh, in the World Championships. Uh, yes. But we all know the tricks, standing behind the pocket on the shot. They, but these are more snooker club tricks, and, and those play, play players don't usually get that far, as Eddie perhaps can testify. What about controlled... Um, <laughs> Controlled <laughs> flatulence. I know Eddie used to. <laughs> Bill Eddie used to li li like to leave a bit of a noise. Bill Werbenick was a, was an expert actually at being able to p place the white ball back exactly where he played the shot from, and with the amount of lager he had in his body, he had superb control of his whole. Well, he just turned his back on the nap, did he? And <laughs> just uh, hold the ball up. And left the, of... Yes, and left the opponent right in it, basically. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yes. uh, a snooker term. That's mm. Bill. Big Bill. Just finally, Steve, can you be world champion again? Because we think you can be. We think this Henry bloke's a bit of a pillow. Who, John Henry? <laughs> Is that John or his brother Stephen? Stephen. All right. Um, I think he's a bit of a goose. I think he's very flaky. He speaks I... well of you. I know he does. Mm. I know he does. That's how big a goose he is. <laughs> <laughs> I'd, I'd, like, I'd like to be able to think I could. It's a, it's a more crowded marketplace now. Yeah. There's a lot of good players, but I, I try my heart out. I don't get so far all the time, but I have my occasional wins. Yeah. It would be nice if it coincided with the World Championships soonish. Before the end of the millennium would be nice. Yeah, well, we think you can do it. That's very kind of you. Thank you. And on that cheerful note, it's time to wish Steve a trophy filled future. And I ask all Bug House viewers whether here in the Charles Goes Native or there at home to get a couple of black balls and bang them together as a way of thanking Steve Davis. <laughs>
think snooker's going wrong. I think snooker's finished. Yes. I think yes. it's all over. Yes. They've got to get more aggression into it. Uh, They've got to have lines on the nap. Yeah. They've got to have music. Yeah. They've got to have pot plants. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Uh, would a nude competition be yes. good, Roy? And a two poles sort of, competition? A, a, oh, I was going to say two cues. Two cues competition. Yes, well, that could work. Yes. And now it's time to welcome to the Charles, a, a singer from the Steve Davis School of Songs. Yes, if you want to, well, let the hips do the walking and talking for a minute. Why not limber up on the lounge? Because the selection is a slab of sonic soul in the shape of I've been thinking, Boucher. And my very good friends go delirious with delight as you welcome to the bug house the cup winning might and power of Mr. Edwin Starr! Yes, uh, Roy, this week the opera world across Europe has been an uproar. Uh, in London, uh, the Royal Opera which has vacated his home at Covent Garden because of renovations has uh, fallen in terrible trouble, financially speaking. Uh, this week has been suggested by the government uh, that a menage a trois, a three-in-the-bed solution, should be uh, constructed. That is, tipping the Royal Opera, the Royal Ballet, and the English National Opera all into Covent Garden uh, when it uh, obviously is refurbished and the renovations are complete. Uh, Roy, uh, how bad is it? How, what's gone wrong with the yes. opera? Uh, I, I, see, I, I love the opera. Well, who doesn't? Uh, who doesn't? And the season this year that's been mounted uh, by the Royal Opera, uh, look, it's just been a sensation. We've had, uh, I think, the marriage of Figaro. Yes. Doesn't that talk to people, oh, that one? No, uh, uh, we've had... Otello. Yes, well, Otello. that's a killer diller, isn't yes, it? That yes, really yes. set you really you back. back. Yeah. I mean, you never recover. Some people right. never recover right. having seen Otello. Yes. And uh, the Barber of Seville. Oh, is that on? That's on oh, as well. Right. And uh, right. it's a pretty lively <laughs> barber too. Uh, <laughs> Look, I, 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 I love it. I don't think it can work. Look, but, but, but having said that, I think they've got to get more out into the field. Now, I, uh, I happen to be at White Hart Lane uh, oh, yes. a couple of weeks ago, and I did a bit of... Uh, Exit polling. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I asked a lot of the punters and a lot of the kiddies in particular, would they like to see a bit of opera? Oh. And uh, all of them said, yes, Roy, we'd love that. Uh, uh. And it seems to me if we could fuse football and opera mm. in mm. some way, mm. there are a number of ways of doing it. Either it's half time entertainment, uh. you get a couple of the opera singers out and they give a bit of a teaser, well. say uh, a little bit of E. Pagliacci. Yeah. Uh, which translates as I'm an idiot. <laughs> so you, you do it in English. Uh, I am an idiot, etc. Uh, and that uh, would get the kiddies in. Uh, and then after the game, the players go off, trucks come out, and you have the full opera. Uh, sure, it might go a little bit late in the night, but uh, so what? If you did the ring cycle, uh, and I know that's screaming out to be done at White Hart Lane, uh, so you get, say, Spurs v Manchester United. Yeah, followed. Clear the players, then you get the ring, yeah. the ring cycle that takes you through <coughs> till, oh, I don't know, maybe eight, nine o'clock the next morning. Uh, That's entertainment. Uh, true, that is. That's going to get people involved. Uh, and talk. That's going to get people talking opera mm. again. Mm. That's going to solve <coughs> the problem. Roy, can I just raise one problem that I've got with the opera, and that yeah. is ticket prices. Now, in the old Covent Garden, I used yeah. to often get a 75-pound seat at the back, yeah. which allowed me to see approximately a third of the stage on a good night. Well, that's now, right, I wasn't you disappointed. Had a big pillar in your way. That's right. Yeah. I wasn't disappointed by that. But when I went yeah. back to see the ring cycle, Wagner's Ring, I had to pay two hundred pound to see it, which I thought wasn't bad for the ring. To get a good ring, it's worth two hundred. That is, pounds. isn't it? But where I drew the line, where I drew the line was when they asked me for another two hundred pound to see the magic flute. I will not pay two hundred pound for a flute. I, I say that here tonight. I am not prepared to put down £200 for a float. No. That seems to me too much. You can yes. go all around the world and see the ring, yes. see a ring for £200. £200. You get, you get a yes. very good deal. Yes. Are the ticket prices... I think £10 for a flute. Yes, £10 for a flute. And maybe £2.50 for, say, Pagliacci, because it's bloody short. Yes. Yeah. Now, Roy, the other thing, the other big thing I think has to be said is the Turner Prize is up for grabs this week. Yeah. You've put in an entry. Yes. Uh, I think it's going to get people talking. What have you put in for the Turner Prize? This is the art prize, of course, a very prestigious yeah. art prize. What have you got in the Turner in 1997? Roy? In the Turner, HG. Look, you, you've got to remember that, that painting's dead as an art form. Yes. And that sculpture's finished. Mm. Installations, well, everybody's doing. Mm. Uh, I thought I'd go a little bit conceptual. Oh, yeah. 
Uh, I'm reminded of, say, Heisenberg's uh, uncertainty principle uh, when it comes to uh, experiments, that the nature of observation changes the experiment. Yes. Well, let's, why don't we try that for art? So, oh, yeah. basically, I've got a space with nothing in it. And people just go in and look. Mm. Uh, I've called it the public imagination by Roy. That's my first exhibit. Yes. The other is a bloody big bum. Yes. <laughs> Yes. What's that called, Roy? It's called Roy's bum. Yes. And it's fully functional. <laughs> right. 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 On the hour. Mm. So, kiddies... You just, you just press a button and it works. Yeah, that's right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, kiddies are allowed to take home. Yes! Yeah, good. Good. Of course they I can. Feel as though and it's very tactile. <laughs> I bet it is. You can fiddle about with it. Mm. Mm. What else can you do with it? Charge That's about it. Really. That's right. Well, having solved the uh, week's ca cultural catastrophes, it's time to welcome uh, to the Prince Charles a woman whose handiwork with a fender base, well, let's face it, the world has admired from a very careful distance yes. for the best part of 25 years. Nissan Cedrics, can you slip into the leathers, throw a leg over the throbbing Harley, and as you can the can, can you simply burst the blister on the Susie Quattro story? <laughs> Yes, Susie. <laughs> Look, uh, you've got a new compile out, or maybe, <clears throat> you know, there is a new compile out. How many compilations of your hits have there been? Oh, my God. Would we be into the 30s yet? I think so. Yeah. I think so. There's so many, it's ridiculous. What say do you have in the issuing of compilations? Oh, not a lot. No. <laughs> unless, no. unless you were smart enough to own all the masters, which, unfortunately, I didn't... You know, I, I got to say this, now that you brought this subject up, we're going to get serious just for a second. Mm. My motivation is not money, and it never has been. So, therefore, I didn't do the greatest deals that I should have done. My motivation was just to get to as many people as possible. Yes. Fame, in other words. Yes. So, I didn't yes. always do the right thing business-wise, but I'm still here, you know. Yes. So. Now, you've been to Australia. This was where I was going, actually, now okay. that I think about it. You've okay. been to Australia 14 <laughs> times. Do you ever talk? 14 times. <laughs> <laughs> He's far more eloquent in his silence than I can be with my talk. I know, I know his sign already, too. He's a Pisces. Anyway, go ahead. Yes, yes. Keep going with this. Uh, many trips to Australia. Yes. Oh, what draws 14. you back to the great southern land? It was my first, um... Oh, gosh, I guess... The first time I realised that I, I had reached my goal. I went down there and the bikies met me at the airport and there gosh. were thousands of people at the shows and it was like... I couldn't breathe, I couldn't go out the hotel and it was like, oh, this is what I've been waiting for all my life. So you'd, it's got special memories for me. Yes. You'd be one of the few performers outside Australia who'd say that going to Australia was their goal. But not going to Australia. Not going to Australia, but being... being Fated being in that famous. way. Yeah. Yeah, yes. Which I always wanted to be, yeah. Yes. Susie... Uh, yes, sir. Uh, <laughs> I, I I'm read, thrilled. Uh, no, I, I read where uh, Elvis Presley, uh, the king, uh, was so impressed with your version of All Shook Up, he requested that you meet him. And uh, you you didn't meet him. You refused. I'm such a Why? Bitch. Why did you knock back the king? Because he's a very he I was mean, a very attractive, uh, he was fit gorgeous. man. Yeah, gorgeous, a fit man. Yeah, very, very fit. fit. Why, 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 why didn't you go and meet the king? I was. I I couldn't meet my hero. Maybe yes. I didn't want to be disappointed. Do you think you would have been? I don't know, but I had him so so big in my mind. You know, yes. I regret it now. Dreadfully. I wish I'd known that he wasn't going to be around. I would have gone. But it kind of scared me. Yes. Yes. How did he make the request? How, you're getting closer as you're talking. Yes, I am. I'm okay. starting to get more interested. Okay. Okay. Now, tell me. How, am, I draw, uh, am I drawing you in now? Oh, yes, 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 yes. We'll end up very close in a few minutes' okay, time. Uh, <laughs> how did it end? How? Who's going to get the video rights to this? That's what I want to know. How did he make the request? Did he phone you up? He phoned up my publicist and said, would you please invite Susie over to meet me? Because yes. her version of All Shook Up is the best since my own. He did say that. Right. So I said no. Right. The, the biggest regret of my life that, well, 
Would you be one of very few people to actually, uh, yeah. you know, knock back the king? Uh, I'd be one of the few that didn't meet him. Yeah, that, well, that knocked back a request of the king. Yeah, I'm stupid. Very stupid, I, I would can't, have thought. Excuse me. <coughs> well, it's your call. <laughs> no, I can't believe that I did yeah. that. I, I wish I had it to do again. Now, when I read as well, when you uh, were auditioning for Happy Days, yes. the first time you were on the set, and yeah. the first time you met Henry Winkler, whom, uh, from a reasonable distance, I've had a reasonable, uh, reasonable amount of respect for, all he was interested in was your bum. <laughs> is this the case? That is the case. Well, I find that terribly disappointing. Well, I'm kind of used to it. Oh. I am. Um, I got told that the first time when I was 10. What's this? That I got my sister's elder. This is true story. But look, they're all listening so quietly, and I can't believe I've backed myself into this corner. No. <laughs> oh, my God, what have I done? Okay, I have to continue. Yes. I was standing in a bathing suit, and my elder sister, who's nine years older than me, her boyfriend said she's going to have a great ass when she gets older. So... Can we say that on TV? Yes. I then went home yes. and inspected my backside from every angle and couldn't work out what they were talking about. Uh, I thought, well, what did they mean? Yes. But it's been like that ever since. So, no, I quite expect it from men. They often do one of those. Look at your uh, ass, yes, as you would say. Yes, as my ass. Now, With the greatest of respect, of course. Did, am I right in thinking that you might have won uh, International oh, no. Ass of the Year? <laughs> <laughs> I did. Mm. I did. Now, who won before you? Was, I, I think it might have been uh, one of the girls out of ABBA. Was, mm, no, was... she never won it, actually. Didn't she? She didn't win oh, it. Or she no. might have been European Arts of the Maybe. Year. Maybe. <laughs> I was universal. You know? But you were the International Arts yeah. of the Year. Now, yes. uh, was there some sort of presentation? or? Uh... <laughs> I mean, how was this acknowledged? Did uh, your agent um, was phoned up? Guess what? Susie's won it. They did. And then it came... Oh, what? They did, and I had, to, I had to go... I got 20 pairs of blue jeans. Yes. Mm. Nearly wrecked them. Yes. Mm. That was a good joke! Yeah. I think they might have heard it before. Oh! <laughs> I don't know whether Steve Davis might have slipped that oh, one in earlier tonight. Yeah. Did he really? I yeah. think so, yeah. Without, yes. and, and that was without a cue? Well, I think yes, Steve won. I think yeah. Steve Sorry. was... Uh, okay, I'm going to behave now. Go ahead. ...was the British bum of the year, <laughs> I think, in about 1979. Yes. Oh, did you know that I played Hurricane Higgins? You played... I oh, played... sorry, I thought you meant in a theatre role. No, no. <laughs> As Hurricane Higgins tonight, Jesse Quattro. Now, acting roles. Yeah, how was uh, uh, Annie Get Your Gun? That was fantastic. That was yeah. one of the biggest thrills of my life because it was... Um, not a small part. It was like a big part. It was in the West End. I'd always wanted to do something like that. It was a challenge. Yes. I nearly died on the opening night. I was just nervous. Yes. And I put on the clothes and I stared in the mirror until I became Annie Oakley. But it was great. Now, you were, were known as the wild one. Yes, my dear. Now, in <laughs> Australia, Johnny O'Keefe was the wild one. Yeah, good sound. Now, remember him? Do you yeah. remember Johnny O'Keefe? Yeah. Did you model yourself on his uh, style at all? Well, how does he look in leather? Well, he's dead now, but he looked... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but he had a tremendous bum, people used to say. <laughs> did he? The bass. Why did you pick the bass as an instrument? And uh, I don't know if you've noticed our bass player, but he has seven strings on his bass. He does. Have you ever thought of the seven stringer, or are you sticking with the four? I have a six. You have a six-string bass? Yeah. Do you ever use the extra two strings? Uh, yeah, you do, but it's, I don't find it's really necessary for my thing yes. that I do in rock and roll. Right. I'm actually a trained uh, classical pianist, by the way, in case you didn't know that. I didn't know and that. And a drummer. I read classical music and I read and play drums. So, And then I picked up the bass. I'm not a failed guitar player. I am a bass player, mm. which a lot of bass players are not. Yes. Well, that was a, which must... maybe explains why he has so many strings. Maybe yeah. he started on guitar. I don't know. Right. It seems an extraordinary thing, though. It would have done uh, when you began uh, for... You know, a woman to play the bass. It seemed to me a singularly sort of masculine. It, it was, it was. But but I, I was little, so I got away with it. Right. But actually, it got given to me. It was all the girls together in a band, and yes. um, everybody picked an instrument. It was my sisters and two other sisters, and I said, "Well, what am I going to play?" Yes. And the big tall sister, she's like six foot tall. She said, "You're playing that." Mm. So yes. I picked it up. It stood as tall as me, and I started playing. But I really like playing bass. I've been playing it for 33 years now. Yes. And how did you end up? I'm born in Detroit. How did you end up living in Essex? And how often do you get to Norwich? 
to Norwich. Yeah. I've played here quite a few times. Yeah. Yeah, different. Do you ever go and look at uh, Norwich? I mean, have you been to the mustard factory or do you get to... Uh... <laughs> the mustard factory, no. Or have you had a look at the cathedral seen. here or any of that? Do you, it, get about, it, do you get about Norwich? Do you Have you got to know Norwich? No, <laughs> not, not really, but I have played here before. But I can't remember the gigs, but I have played in this area. And on that cheerful note, it's time to wish Susie a jump from the future. And I ask all Bloghouse viewers, whether here in the Prince Charles or there at home, to get out their compilation of Susie's hits and jump up and down on them as a way of thanking Susie Quattro. And now in the Prince Charles, it's time to celebrate your endeavour with the threads. Once again, it's time for This Is Living. Each week, some lucky member of the Bug House audience gets to go on a trip of a lifetime simply because they had the vision, the guts, the game plan and the drive from the back line to make a little bit of effort with their appearance here this evening. Before we go to this week's winners, let's have a look at the deliriously happy couple who greeted the judge this time last week. Roy. Yes, I see. It was uh, Jenny and Colin. Here they are in the Bug House and we sent them off to Great Yarmouth and they had a tremendous time. Look at that. Look at those kids. They had a tremendous time, HG. And tonight we plucked from the jackpot prize pool two, three magnificent prizes, plus, as mentioned, a trip of a lifetime. Firstly, we've got some Australian mustard here. It's tremendous, it's hot, it's got poke, it's got grunt. And to help it come out a little bit more easily, we've got a magnificent container of goanna salve. But the prizes don't stop there because we've got another of the mascots of the Sydney Olympic Games in the year 2000. This is Dickhead. Mm. And uh, last week we gave away Dickhead. Dickhead this as week well. Yes, Dickhead Dickhead. Dickhead. Look at the wingspan on that bird. Yeah. It'd be tremendous. <laughs> Just bring it down with a 12 gauge. Plus, Roy, where are they off to? The happy couple this week, HG, are going to look at the real inside Norwich. The secret Norwich. The secret Norwich. We <laughs> started a mustard shop. This is the home of mustard. Look at the history. How it all began all those years ago with rancid meat. How are we going to eat it? We better cover it with something to make it absolutely unrecognisable. <laughs> mustard it is. The mustard seed, mustard salve, mustard ointment uh, for the ring on the way out. <laughs> uh, beautiful stuff it is. You can join the mustard club and what wags they have there. And then it's up for a pizza and rush in here and ask for their vegetarian and mustard special and watch the waiter's jaw hit the floor. But never mind because when he produces it, it'll be slipping in and slipping out. And then it's up to the church, Roy. Yes, HG, the young prelate here, he'll be taking you through, showing you his cathedral, celebrating its 900th year this year. They've never got the pipes right in this place. They'll be blowing them out, cleaning them out for you. A beautiful cathedral. And then it's off to the castle keep, and we were lucky enough to snap these pictures on a Wednesday afternoon when an enormous crowd was on hand at the castle keep. And there's so much to see there. Here's an ancient rave costume that is as modern today as it was yesterday. And then it's off to the dungeon for a marvellous interest in punishment. Ye olde, worldly style, Norwich style. And isn't it good to see a couple of young kiddies involved with grins from ear to ear about the punishment they're going to get, Roy? Yes, it's beautiful. I see here a lot of deadens. They took face masks of people that they hanged. And uh, you get to have a look at the S&M gear, HG. <laughs> Anything you want. And here it is, the uh, drop box so for the kiddies. Sit in there and enjoy the punishment. And, of course, kiddies think they've got it pretty hard today. Well, in Roy and Mai's day, it was all this sort of face gear to keep us quiet. Yes, yeah, shut up. And then, up. of course, Roy, it's off to the big one. Yes, you get to co-host. This time, the time, the place with Johnny Stapleton. You'll be there co-hosting with him because this is Norwich. This is living. You look fantastic. What's your name? Paul. Paul and? Denise. Paul and Denise. Look, here's the gear. I'll give you all that. <laughs> you know Norwich well, I suppose? Not too well. Uh, have you been to the mustard shop? No. Have you been to the cathedral? Yes. Have you been to the castle keep? Yes. You haven't been to the mustard shop? No. Have you been to Pizza One? Nope. Well, I love your gear. Here, take it. Take this. I'll give you a couple of dollars. This will get you into, uh, well, to make a donation to the cathedral. There you go. <laughs> Enjoy it because this, this is, is living. living. Oh, yes, indeed. <laughs> It's 
time to welcome to the bughouse a man who realised a lifetime ambition today when he was named third division manager of the month at a glittering lunch that uh, featured celebrities and superstars of all the codes. Nissan Cedrics, can you go completely posh when the ball hits the back of the net and as the referee blows full time, can you lay on us the Barry Fry story? <laughs> Thank you, ladies. Now, Barry, Thank before we... Be, be, yes, of course, before we get a few, um, you know, a bit of a chat going on. Ask. Who's been sitting in this seat? <clears throat> Susie Quattro, oh. Bum of the Year, 19... When was oh, it? Oh, yes, what about 1982 or three, I think. Mean. Now, uh, before we have a chat, we need to see you in action here. Now, we've got... Uh, I ask people at home to listen very carefully and play close attention, and I point out that Peterborough are playing in the all-blue shirt or in the all-blue strip. Let's have a look at you in action now on the sideline. You're going forward here? <laughs> now, you're, you're a, obviously a self-confessed football maniac. Have you ever thought about seeking professional help for your problems? <laughs> yeah, fancy that, yeah. And um, you obviously have a great relationship with the crowd who come along. Do you know them all personally? I'd like to, yeah. I did last year. They all shouted, fry out, fry <laughs> yeah. out. Now, look, you've, you've gone down a division with Peterborough yes. and you're on top. Uh, is it better being on top of a lower division or struggling the, in the relegation zone of the division above? Well, let me tell you, people in football tell you it's the same pressure whether you're at the bottom of the league or at the top. I'll tell you, that's a load of bollocks. Yes, <laughs> yes. It's now, far better <laughs> when you're at the top. Right. Does it make it easier with sponsorship deals or, you know, uh, luring players to the club if you're a winning side? Yeah, definitely. I mean, our gates this year are up by a thousand su supporters. Our fans have been absolutely magnificent, despite the turmoil on and off the field last year. They've stuck with us, and, and although we're in a lower division, we're winning, and the fans are coming back in their droves. They're magnificent. Now, going back to your own playing days, uh, you know, it's said that uh, you basically um, gambled and, uh, you know, girled and grogged away a promising career. Now, it must have been a fantastic trip on the way down <laughs> if what we see here is yeah. where you've ended up. How bad was it? How rowdy were you when you were playing? I enjoyed myself. <laughs> and um, I started at the very top at Manchester United and uh, rapidly fell to the bottom, unfortunately. <laughs> But I enjoyed it along the way, and uh, I I'd like to think I've learnt a little bit, and some of the players I come in contact now, I tell them uh, where I went wrong, and to uh, everything's drink, women, gambling, all right in moderation. Mm. But they don't, don't take no notice of me. <laughs> <laughs> Just as well. And who, you know, you would have met, uh, or you would have uh, been carousing with a lot of big name players. Oh, but yeah. some of them could handle it, and some of them, like yourself, couldn't. No, I don't mean to be unkind here. But no, some that's right. No, that's yeah. right. I couldn't handle it. You're right. Um, yeah, Dennis Law, George Best. Well, he couldn't uh, handle it either. I don't mean no, to be unkind but, to him either. But Bestie was brilliant for me, you know, because uh, he sympathised with me because I fell off the ladder so quickly. <laughs> And I might have started at the top in uh, my playing career at Man United, but I certainly started at the bottom at Dunstable as a manager. Mm. And 
my first gate was 37 people. <laughs> the next gate was 43, but my family came. <laughs> so I had to have a gimmick to sort of let everybody know in Bedfordshire that there was a club at Dunstable. So I, got, I went to Slack Alice's, that was uh, Bestie's club, and uh, I uh, persuaded him to play for me. And to be honest, there was 12,000 and 14,000 turned up to see him play. We was on news at 10 and everybody knew where Dunstable was. And we went on to win the league that year, scoring 105 goals. So, fantastic. <laughs> Barry, um, when I was a player, we used to put a lot of store in team bonding. Uh, our coach, uh, Grassy Granell, yes, uh, well known here, obviously. Uh, <laughs> Grassy used to take us up into the bush and uh, we'd take all our clothes off. <laughs> and he'd get us to build a car and then drive into town. <laughs> now, what do you do for team bonding? No. Uh, what's the fry style? <laughs> well, I think that's very important. Last year when I came into Peterborough, all the players, everybody was kicking in different directions. So I said to my chairman at the start of this season, I want to bond the players. I yes. want to take them away to Dublin for 10 days. Mm. So important. So it cost him 30 grand, but Peter mm. Boyzo was very generous. He let me get the lads away. And I mean, we, tr we took it serious. We trained in the morning, we trained in the afternoon, and then we all got pissed together at night. Mm. <laughs> And that is tremendous bonding. Yes. That's the truth. Mm. Yeah, that's the truth. You get to know people you get to know when people. they're pissed a lot more. Yeah. But, you well, know. why don't you try the, you know, go out in the fence somewhere in a buff and, uh, <laughs> and no, build I something together. That one. I don't fancy that one. Well, in summertime, obviously, yeah, you wouldn't yeah. go in, would you? But, be silly. Um, normally, I'm willing to try anything yeah. just to improve results, you know what yeah. it's like. Look, should Jerry Francis be sacked? No. Why not? He's done nothing. <laughs> You're correct, but <laughs> a lot of his players haven't been available. Mm. I personally think that Terry Venable should have never left Spurs. Him and Sugar, I mean, Sugar's absolute idiot mm. for letting him go. He's brilliant on the finances, Sugar, but mm. Terry Venables is one of the best coaches in the world, and he was getting it right at Tottenham, and they would have been up there challenging the Man United of this world now. But unfortunately, they had a row and they split up, and. Uh, you know, Spurs lost his Australians game. Yes, my yeah, son. yes, 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 that's, that's right. right. That's now, right. have you had a chance to look at the uh, the Australian Socceroos under the firm grip of uh, you know El Tel? Yes, I have. And do you think they're just changing tack here slightly? Do you think his recent problems with the courts here are a vindictive legal system paying back El Tel for taking the Australian job? <laughs> they're trying to rub him out, move him on, get him out of England. They won't do it, mate. No, they won't do it. Yes. And, uh, He'll can... fight them all. Now, listen, I, I want to put you on the spot here. We're talking about France, 1998. Yes. Can you see Australia v England in the final? No, definitely not. <laughs> I can in another ten years, but I think next year's a bit, bit early. But we've beaten New Zealand. That's always been our hurdle. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Tell's got us fired up. Uh, no, the Socceroos it, could go all the bloody way this time, Barry. Let me tell you, mate, he's a top, top coach in the yeah. world. And he will you. get your kangaroos going, pal. The Socceroos, <laughs> thanks very Socceroos, much. Socceroos, sorry, Socceroos. Sorry. The kangaroos are doing very nicely. They'll be at Old Trafford. Oh, well, no, yeah. today the game was played. Yeah. Uh, or tomorrow, as it turns out. Now, look, um, <laughs> uh, speaking of dud coaches, yeah. I want to run a name past you because I know you think of him the same way I do. Rude Hullet. <laughs> He does bugger all. <laughs> he just swans in, sits in the dugout, goes home when the you know when the referee blows the whistle at the That's end of right. time. He doesn't put in. He doesn't know any of the second the, the reserve graders. No, no, he doesn't no. get to meet anyone. He doesn't no. care. What's I, I mean? How did he luck into that job? He's got the luckiest job in the world. Well, I go and watch my youth team. I go I and watch you my do. reserves. I you go and watch my first Barry. team. I do everything. You Who's put in. It? He watches in that game for an hour and a half. And that's know. it. Yeah, but he gets 50 grand for doing that a week. Mm. Well, where's the justice here, Barry? I don't know. See, you play with your heart. <laughs> Soccer I'm football needs people passionate. like you. I'm very passionate. I take it very seriously. I know you bloody well For do. all the punters. Well, mm. why Ruth don't we... give a shit and he gets I know he grand a week. <laughs> <laughs> well, look. <laughs> oh, no. I was going to say the game's bent, but we won't get into well, that. Well, the game is bent. 
I mean, if we can afford the hoolets of this world, swanning in here with a wheelbarrow, us shoveling the money in, and off he shoots. And he'll leave us in, shh, you know what, when of he's ready. Of course he will. Yeah. We've got to weed out the hoolets. Here, here. And bring here. in the fries. <laughs> yeah. Yes! yes. <laughs> now, no. posh into Europe. Posh into Europe. What's the fry agenda? When can we see Peterborough taking on some of those feisty towns in France? When can we see them taking apart the Dutch? When are they going to move into Scandinavia? Malmo have been screaming for it for years. <laughs> and I can see you and Peterborough giving them the fry treatment. When are you going to get into Russia? Mamansk, if there's such a place. When are you going to get into Tajikistan? When is the posh going to take on the rest of Europe? We've got a five-year plan to get out of the third division and play Northampton. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll do it. <laughs> now, obviously, when, you, when we get, a, you know, uh, managers and coaches on the show, we always ask them where they stand on sex before the game. Oh. Where, where do you stand on sex before the game? Don't I try to get it every no, morning after the <laughs> I thought you might say that. And how about for the players? Uh, yeah, I mean, George Best used to have it at half time and it didn't do him no good. <laughs> and he undid it. No, I think sex is brilliant because it, you know, calms you down and gets you ready for more action, so to speak. I understand, I understand. So I'm a great believer in sex. Right. Well, I would be when I was six kids and three grandchildren and... Yes, 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 yes. yes, yes. So this five-year plan, how's it going then, Barry? How's it shaping up at this stage? Well, we're in advance at the moment because we're top of the league. We could be playing Northampton a lot sooner than what we expect. <laughs> yes, yes. So, and going to second division next year? Yes. Uh, please, God, to repay Peter Boyzo, our chairman, owner, president, yeah. and all the fans who's been absolutely brilliant to us at Peterborough. We now, want to repay them. There is a downside to a person having your passion for the game, and that is it can knock your heart about a bit, Barry. <laughs> How's your heart? Well, it's still there. A lot of people say, I couldn't have had two heart attacks, I ain't got no heart, but they're wrong. I have, and I'm still going. But uh, yeah. I think it's good. I think the uh, passion that the game has um, keeps the old blood running around the arteries, you know what I mean? So that'll keep yeah. me going. Yeah, and your doctor confirms this? He wants you to get wound up? Well, he, he keeps telling me to take it easy, but it's like talking to that brick wall, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so you never listened as a player, and now you're not listening as a manager. No, That's no. a very good sign. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, uh, Barry, obviously, we wish you all the best with these ambitions to play Northampton, and, uh, you know, I know Roy and me will be certainly we'll be turning there. up. You'll and notice there. that we've talked for 10 minutes without really talking about how corrupt the game is. And we'll leave that for another time because on this Stay cheerful note, that. it's time to wish Barry f uh, first division field future. And I ask all Big House viewers, whether here in the Prince Charles or there at home, to go a little bit crazy and get sent off as a way of thanking Barry Fry. <laughs> Yes, sadly, we come to the end of another bug house. Roy, where are you off to in the next set of seven? Uh, H.C., I'm going to go to Hobo's Country and Western. Yes. Uh, this is Hobo's of Hunstanton. <laughs> or it might be Hunstanton. <laughs> Hunstanton sounds better. <coughs> what uh, division do they play? I don't know where in? it is. I hope it isn't too far away, but... Uh, <laughs> It's a cabaret night uh, mm -hmm. on Saturday night uh, featuring Tobias, mm. uh, who's described here as a vocal guitar playing saxophonist. <laughs> Quite how you put those things together, I'm not sure. I guess he comes out and hmm for a little while, uh, then on with the guitar, and, uh, and off he shoots. Uh, not to be missed. Yes, yes. Well, I'm going to take him up on that. Yes, Enjoy yes. a meal. Or have a drink at the bar, and if you don't want to, you don't have to see Tobias. Yes, yes. <laughs> Roy, do you understand any of the songs he does? Does he do Up Where We Belong, some of those duets? I think he does. Uh, I think he does. Uh, I think he does all the Bee Gees classics as well. I think he starts with I Started a Joke. <laughs> <laughs>
and, and ends up with Massachusetts. <laughs> well, look, I had such a good... Some uh, people watching the show, I remember last week, I went up to the Swaffham Raceway where they had a fireworks night and a That's lot right. of stock cars. Yeah. Well, guess what they've got on this week at the Swaffham Raceway? A fireworks night and a lot of stock cars. No. So going, I had such a good time, I'm going again. Uh... <clears throat> You know, I do love TQs when I can get a, you know, a shifty yeah. at them, and I, I love anything to do with your drag racing, yes. but stock cars are my favourites. And to yeah. think... Of and all the drivers, race. all the drivers smoke? While they go round, yes, yes. indeed. And they've got, a, they've got a special thing, a sort of what I understand is what we would know as a hill driver's display. Oh, yes. Uh, where a lot of cars, you know, sort of... A do lot of drivers smoking with... <laughs> Bungers up their nose and that sort of thing. That's right, <laughs> waiting for them to go pop. Yes. Uh, yes, so it's a big night there, and if anybody would like to come over, it gets underway at 7 pm. Mm. As we sign off from the Prince Charles Goes Native, Roy and I would like to thank Melvin Hayes, Steve Davis, Edwin Starr, Susie Quattro, Barry Fry, the Nissan Cedrics, Britain's brand new Bee Gees, and you, the audience, whether here in the Prince Charles Goes Native or there at home on the Toke, Stroke, and Poke. Mm. Thanks once again for taking an interest in variety. Finally, it's time to feature more of the best of British and a trick, given that this performer was born in the USA. Now, tonight, uh, the best of British bag burst opens with the belter Devil Gate Drive. My very good friends, you've seen a little bit of her in the bug house already this evening, and the vibes I'm getting are that you're ready for a whole lot more. So get your motor running, cruise out onto the highway, and do the ton with Miss Susie Quattro. <laughs> Gentlemen, badges and bandicoots, buffets and bludgers, it's party night, it's time to dance, it's time to pants, it's time to blow into the bug house.